A Lined by Writing By Charles Dickens Audiobook 13x73 He gave readers a succession of striking sketches of metropolitan and provincial, Dull, Yorkshire, scenes and characters including Golden Square in Soho, the usurer Ralph Nickleby and his eccentric clerk, Miss La Creevy the miniature painter, Squeers the rascally schoolmaster, Duthy Bowie's Hall, and the Kenwigs Charles Dickens family. His continuing problems with Bentley are reflected in a pointed joke in Nickleby 4, ch. 14, about the meekness of the Kenwigs's revered uncle, Mr. Lillivick the water rates collector. If he had been an author who knew his place, he couldn't have been more humble. Despite the basic sketch format and the interpolated tales in these initial numbers of Nickleby Dickens was clearly paying attention to characterization, plot, and structure. Ralph Nickleby represents his first attempt, however crude and perfunctory, to psychology a character, accounting for villainous behavior in terms of response to early experience and upbringing. He looks forward to more complex characters like Jonas Chuzzlewit, Uriah Heep, Steerforth, Tom Gradgrind, and Henry Gowan. As regards plot, Dickens lays the ground for a two-strand narrative by providing not only a young hero who has to leave his family to seek his fortune but also a heroine, sister to the hero, whose trials and tribulations will be set in London, and he loses no time in setting his wicked uncle villain to work. Despite all this, reviewers tended to see Nickleby as simply another Pickwick, promising to be as humorous and amusing as its great predecessor. It is, unsurprisingly, to Forstner's notices in the examiner that we must turn to find a critic alert to new developments in Dickens's writing. Forster would, of course, have been well aware of Dickens's ambitions and intentions as a writer so we may feel some confidence in interpreting these examiner notices as reflecting Dickens's own view of his developing work or, at the very least, not conflicting with it. The review of the first number of Nickleby, April 1, 1838, noted that it showed the same qualities that had made Pickwick so popular but with the addition of even better promise on the score of a well-laid design and of greater truth and precision of character. Smike's portrait in the second number is found more terrible and affecting than anything in Oliver Twist, May 6. The description of Duthie Bowie's Hall in Nickleby 3 is compared to Hogarth whilst MRS Nickleby is pronounced to be hit off to the life, June 3, and the utter absence of the forced or melodramatic is praised in Nickleby 4 which shows a most affecting mixture of the ludicrous and terrible. Point 20 These examiner notices apart, there was little critical discussion of the new work by reviewers, though much enthusiastic excerpting from it as there had been from sketches and Pickwick. Inevitably, it fell prey to the hack dramatists and the plagiarists wholly unabashed by Dickens's proclamation against them beginning whereas we are the only true and lawful boss. Written at the beginning of March and published both in the periodical press and as a handbill. Nick Ellis Nick Elba e by Boss, Eight Pages for a Penny, appeared simultaneously with Nickleby I. Seeking to steal a march on his theatrical plunderers, Dickens offered to dramatize Oliver himself for the actor-manager Frederick Yates. He describes the plot as being involved and complicated and says he himself does not yet know how it will end so no hack dramatist will be able to periodicals into novels. 1837-1839 Anticipate him. Nothing came of this proposal but between March and December 1838 no less than five unauthorized adaptations of Oliver appeared in the London theatres. Forster tells us how Dickens attended one and was so mortified that in the middle of the first scene he lay down upon the floor of his box and stayed there until the final curtain. A year later he included a swinging attack on these piratical dramatists in Nickleby 15 but to no avail whatever and he continued to suffer their depredations for many more years. Point 21 At the beginning of June Dickens took his family for a two-month sojourn in a villa at Twickenham. He and Catherine entertained a stream of family visitors and other guests, even the irritating Bentley. Beard and Forster, of course, were frequently there and Dickens established a balloon club with them. 
ostensibly intended for his children's amusement, it gave Dickens another outlet for the Mudfogian style of comic writing in which he so clearly delighted, like his spoof letter to the Times describing a balloon ascent from Gammon Lodge by that intrepid aeronaut Mr. Forster. He had some more private epistolary fun with an impassioned love letter to Forster written as from the pen of a young lady admirer who had just learned he was to marry another whilst, about the same time, he was composing for Nickleby v. what is surely the greatest comic letter in English literature, Fanny Squeers's hilarious report to Ralph Nickleby of Nicholas's assault upon her father leaving two benches steepled in his gore. Point 22 On July 7 Dickens finished the first installment, two chapters of what had now become Oliver Twist Book 3. Three days later he told Bentley he had planned Oliver to the close, and if I have any fortune in preparing the next no of Nickleby expeditiously, hope to make a great start on the rest of Oliver's final volume this month. Nickleby V, to which he turned that same day, is essentially four Bosian sketches, including two of a fatuously pompous and shameless MP. They are written with tremendous verve and we certainly have no sense of reading stuff which has been dashed off to clear the decks for another task. But nor do we feel any sense of a plot gathering momentum, even though experienced novel readers would certainly have expected to see more of the beautiful young lady, scarcely eighteen and possessed of an exquisite shape, whose brief appearance in the employment agency in Chapter 16 makes such an impression on Nicholas. At this point, all Dickens's plotting skills have to be focused on Oliver. Point 23 Bentley had been hoping for this first Dickens novel as Oliver had now become, to be finished ready for three-volume publication in September, under the agreement of 28 September. 1837 The deadline had, in fact, been midsummer 1838. It would then still have had several months to run in Bentley's. It was becoming evident, however, that completion could not now be expected until October. Dickens had, after all, now to work out not one plot but two. The first Charles Dickens is the powerful Newgate one involving Fagin, Sykes and Nancy which ends with Fagin in the condemned cell. The second is the Gothic one involving Oliver, now a passive heroine figure, Monks, Brownlow and the Maleys. The elaborate denouement of this latter plot bogs down the novel in Book 3, Chapter 11 when even Monks complains about the long-windedness of Brownlow's explanations, and again in Book 3, Chapter 13, when the explanations are resumed. Dickens contrived to yoke the two plots together through the iconic Virgin and were seen between Rose and Nancy in Book 3, Chapter 3 ch. 40, but then needed someone to dodge Nancy, clearly not a suitable job for a likable character like Charlie Bates or the Dodger. The sneaking Noah Claypole was ideal for the work and Dickens happily retrieved him from the early Mudfog chapters. He also brilliantly solved the problem of how to dispose of the Dodger, the novel's greatest comic character, for whom neither penitence nor punishment fitted the bill, a reformed Charlie Bates is all very well but a repentant Dodger is as unimaginable as a sober M.R.S. Gamp. Remembering his model for this character, the irrepressibly impudent boy thief in criminal courts and sketches, he contrived a splendidly unrepentant comic triumphant exit for the Dodger in Book 3, Chapter 2 ch. 43.24 During late July and all of August Dickens was clearing the decks for a concentrated final assault on Oliver. Having made Bentley agree to the suspension of this work for the September numbers so he could concentrate on writing the denouement of the story straight through, as it were, he supplied his statutory 16 pages, with two pages extra, by means of another facetious piece on the British Association, then holding its annual conference in Newcastle. Internal evidence shows that he was still working on his full report of the second meeting of the Mudfog Association for the advancement of everything as late as August 22nd. He somehow also found time to write a 2,000-word polemical review for the Examiner, published September 2, of a pamphlet issued on behalf of the Ballantines, Scots Printers and Business Partners. 
This pamphlet strongly defended the Ballantines against the accusation that they had been partly responsible for Scott's financial collapse, an accusation made in John Gibson Lockhart's massive biography of Scott, his father-in-law, which Dickens had been poring over during the past year. Dickens vehemently defended Lockhart, his piece, he told Forster, was very moderate in tone, if not in length. No doubt the tensions between himself and Bentley, the increasing tendency of reviewers to hail him as Scott's successor, and his own linking of himself with Scott as a phenomenally successful and prolific writer who was hugely enriching his publishers but not himself would have given a distinct edge to his championship of Lockhart.25 With all this on hand Dickens sometimes found himself writing till half-past midnight and having the steam to get up afresh the next morning. On September 3 he retreated with Catherine to the Isle of Wight for nine days for periodicals and two novels. 1837-1839 Oliver purposes and there, intent as he must have been on working on the last stages of the novel, he still found enough writing energy to compose 44 lines of doggerel verse instructions to the landlord of their hotel in Alum Bay. Back in London on September 12, he set about negotiating with the help of Forster and Mitten, yet another agreement with Bentley. This one, signed on September 22, dealt with the editorship of the Miscellany, the publication of Oliver Twist, always referred to in the agreement as a series of original papers, and the writing of an original novel entitled Barnaby Rudge. A Tale of the Great Riots which it was now agreed would be serialised in Bentley's for 18 months following the conclusion in the Journal of Oliver. Everything was settled to Dickens's satisfaction. Meanwhile, in the September Nickleby he had placed Kate Nickleby in the household of the posturing Wittiter Lees and Nicholas and Smike in the company of Mr. Crumb Miles and his troop of strolling players. He knew, therefore, that he had to, for him, highly congenial comic veins to work as regards this story during the next month or so when Oliver would be making such heavy demands on him. From his hilarious description of the affairs, domestic and theatrical of Mr. Crumb Miles Dickens switched immediately back to the dark and desperate world of Fagin's London and the gruesomely bloody murder of Nancy. Following this, the murder was written by October 2nd. Dickens was for the next fortnight incessantly occupied night and day on the book, much hardened by Thomas Lister's highly laudatory survey of his work in the October Edinburgh Review. Lister compared him to Hogarth but without Hogarth's touches of misanthropy and coarseness and singled out Oliver as calculated to give a more favourable impression of Mr. Dickens's powers as a writer than anything else which he has yet produced. More interest in the story, a plot better arranged, characters more skillfully drawn. 26 Dickens told Bentley on October 3 that he was writing this final volume of Oliver with greater care, and I think with greater power than I have been able to bring to bear on anything yet. It must have been around this time that, besides pressing ahead with the writing, he was also going back over the first 18 installments as printed in Bentley's and making over 200 deletions and emendations. Many are simply stylistic but over a dozen relate to the way in which Dickens transformed, during the work of composition, his glance at the new poor law of spring 1837 into a novel, beginning with the deletion of the reference to Mudfog in the first sentence of the first installment. As to the greater power in the writing to which Dickens refers, the flight of Sykes and his death, the empathetic description of Fagin's sensations during his trial, and his frenzied behavior in the condemned cell certainly comprise the most psychologically intense scenes that Dickens has written to date. He seems to have astonished even himself with Fagin who he told Forster, is such an out-and-outer I don't know what to make of him. His readers would have been Charles Dickens surprised by his flouting of convention at the end of the novel. It has been pointed out that in Bulwer Lytton's Paul Clifford and other popular novels featuring a hero of doubtful or mysterious origins this hero is invariably revealed in the end to be legitimate. This does not happen with Oliver, however, where Dickens prefers to follow the example of Fielding's Tom Jones but, unlike Fielding, 
he seems more concerned with Oliver's weak and erring mother, the dead Agnes, than with Oliver himself. The challenging last few words of the story are devoted to her, and Dickens insisted on Crookshanks changing his final plate, which at first made no reference to Agnes but instead portrayed Oliver in a happy fireside group with the Maleys. Even though it was too late for the substitution of a different plate in the first impression of the first volume edition, published November 9, Crookshank was obliged thereafter to replace his fireside scene with one showing Oliver and Rose standing alone together in a church. They are looking at the memorial tablet to Agnes described by Dickens in the text. Fully aware, of course, that the idea of a memorial to a fallen woman in a church would cause raised eyebrows and this final image and the last words of the novel serve to underline the fact that Oliver is illegitimate. Point 27 Another remarkable feature of the last chapter, and one that connects with the contraton over Crookshank's last plate, is the long, yearning paragraph in which Dickens says how much he wishes he could continue the story to show Rose Maley in all the bloom and grace of early womanhood. The life and joy of the fireside circle and the lively summer group, to recall the tones of that clear laugh, and conjure up the sympathizing tear that glistened in that soft blue eye, and so forth. It is, in fact, a kind of elegy for Mary Hogarth, Rose's original, and perhaps the real offense of Crookshank's plate was that, while it illustrated one of the very scenes of Rose's future that Dickens longed to describe, for him it fell painfully short of his intensely personal concern with the subject. A few years later Fizz's illustration of another fireside scene, Little Paul Dombey with M.R.S. Pipchin, was to cause him similar distress, in this case definitely intensified by strong personal memories. Point 28 With Oliver Dunn, Dickens could turn his full attention to Nickleby. Once again, he went on a journey partly to be out of London when Oliver was published, a practice he followed with all his subsequent novels, and partly to reconnoiter possible new scenes for the developing action of Nickleby. That this was part of his motivation is suggested by the fact that Brown accompanied him. Forster was left to deal with proofing the last chapters of Oliver, Bentley was making prodigious exertion to get the book out on the advertised date of November 7 and Dickens and Brown set out from London on October 29. They went first to Leamington and visited Warwick Castle, later recalled in Dombey and Son, Kenilworth with its strong Scott associations, Dickens found the place beautiful beyond expression, an ideal spot for a lazy periodicals into novels. 1837-1839 To view this image, please refer to the print version of this book. 13 The cancelled fireside plate from Oliver Twist Summer Holiday, and Stratford. At this last place Dickens stored up material, the birthplace, visitors, scribblers, which he later used to delicious comic effect in the December number of Nickleby, ch. 28, in which M.R.S. Wittiterly languidly discourses about the effect on writing one's name in the visitor's book. It kindles up quite a fire within one. Dickens and Brown then travelled to Shrewsbury via Birmingham and Wolverhampton, through landscape that proved a real eye-opener for Dickens, as he wrote to Catherine on November 1st. Miles of cinderpaths and blazing furnaces and roaring steam engines, and such a mass of dirt gloom and misery as I never before witnessed. This grim Charles Dickens scenery found no place in Nickleby but a year or more later Dickens made effective use of it in the old curiosity shop when describing Little Nell's flight with her grandfather through the black country. From Shrewsbury he and Brown took the scenic route to Langollen, where their hotel bill included payments for a harpist, something Dickens remembered years later, in The Holly Tree Inn, 1855 when he described Welsh inns with the women in their round hats, and the harpers with their white beards, venerable but humbugs, I am afraid. From there they went to Liverpool where Forster joined them and then, armed with letters of introduction from Ainsworth, all three travelled to Manchester, Ainsworth's native city, on 6 November.29 Ainsworth had written to his friend Crossley, 
I rather suspect he Dickens is reconnoitering for character, and to another friend, a solicitor called Gilbert Winter, he gave a hint that Dickens wishes to see the Grants. These were two brothers of humble origin who had become immensely prosperous merchants, widely celebrated for their seemingly boundless benevolence. Dickens would have been naturally curious to meet them but may also have been thinking they might serve him as models for a character or characters who might befriend and help his beleaguered young hero. Winter gave a dinner party with the Grants among the guests so Dickens could meet them. He also gave a breakfast party in honour of the London visitors, and a cousin of Ainsworth's who was present recorded that Mr. Dickens was then writing Nicholas Nickleby, and I well remember his reading the proofs of his novel, and smiling at his own writings. The famous writer, he added, was then a smart-looking young man of rather effeminate appearance, wearing long hair, very much like the pictures of the hero of his story. I still call to mind his polished boots and drawing room like attire. No reference to the Grants appears in Dickens's surviving correspondence from this period but there is an allusion to another possible Nickelbyan outcome of this trip in a letter of December 29 to the Irish journalist Edward Fitzgerald in which Dickens writes that he has been shown the worst cotton mill and the best and found no great difference between them. The experience, he writes, has disgusted and astonished him beyond all measure and he intends to strike the heaviest blow in my power for these unfortunate creatures, but whether I shall do so in the Nickleby, or wait some other opportunity, I have not yet determined. Point 30 He made a sudden decision to return to London with Forster in order to ensure there shall be no mistakes in Oliver on November 8 but it was already too late to change Crookshank's last plate, as we have seen he wanted. Two. He also wanted to change the way he was named on the title page. He wanted his first proper novel to appear under the name of Charles Dickens rather than that of Boz, a clear signal that he now considered himself to have arrived as a fully-fledged author, no longer just a writer, no matter how successful, of sketches or Pickwick-style periodicals. Both the changes he wanted had to wait until periodicals into novels. 1837 to 1839 The first impression of this first edition of Oliver in volume form had been exhausted. Nickleby meanwhile was approaching the halfway mark and Dickens had to apply himself to it at once in order to ensure that the December number would appear on time. He found himself unable to write with his normal speed because, he believed, of the intensity of his Oliver work the previous month and it was November 24 before he had finished the number. Despite the pressure under which it was composed, it proved to be a sparkling one with some splendid comic business both for M.R.S. Nickleby and for the Crumb Miles troupe. Dickens then turned to the Lamplighter, a farce he was writing for McCready. This was very much in his facetious mudfog association vein, featuring a foolish astrologer and an absurdly flimsy plot. The only good thing in it is the Lamplighter himself, a role written for Harley. Always alert to the comic potential of people defining themselves by their trade or profession, Dickens gave the Lamplighter what he quite rightly thought was a funny speech about a Lamplighter unable to survive the advent of gas. At last he went and hanged himself on a lamp iron in St. Martin's Lane, that he'd always been very fond of, and as he was a remarkably good husband, and never had any secrets from his wife, he put a note in the two-penny post as he went along, to tell the widder where the body was. On December 5 he read the piece to McCready who thought the dialogue good but the plot meagre. He was much impressed by Dickens's reading, however. He reads as well as an experienced actor would. He is a surprising man. But the farce did not survive a second reading and Dickens later recycled it as a short story for the volume being got up for the benefit of Macron's widow. 31 Dickens's diary entries for December record much conviviality, including two meetings of the trio or Cerberus Club which consisted of three members only, Forster, Ainsworth and himself. It succeeded an earlier club consisting of Dickens and Forster alone, for which Dickens, with characteristic exuberance, had drawn up a set of mock rules and regulations. 
He dined out with Cruikshank on December 11 and on the 12th supped out, after chairing a dinner of the Literary Fund, with the distinguished antiquarian artist George Catermol, a man twelve years his senior, with whom he was developing a close friendship. After that he buckled down to writing Nickleby X, CHS 30-33 and to getting the stage ready for the entry in the next number of the grants in the guise of the Cheeryble brothers. Once Nickleby X was finished there was more jollity. A Christmas Eve visit to Covent Garden with Forster and Forster's young poet friend Robert Browning to watch McCready rehearse the pantomime, dinner with Elliotson on December 28, with Ainsworth on the 29th, with Talford on the 30th and on the 31st a final dinner of the year at home in Doughty Street with Forster, Ainsworth and Cattermol among the guests. 32 For two years now Dickens had had the labour of editing Bentley's miscellany in addition to his own writing commitments. That this editing involved a huge Charles Dickens amount of toil and dispensation of practical advice on his part can be deduced from his surviving letters to contributors and would-be contributors doubtless a tiny percentage of the totality of such correspondence. As is clear from his later editorial work for his own journals, this was a kind of labor he delighted in, except, perhaps, when dealing with such an independent-minded contributor as Elizabeth Gaskell. He enjoyed literary collaboration at all levels provided always that he was primus in terpairs and had a major financial stake in the resulting publication. This was not his situation with regard to Bentley, who presumed to behave virtually like a CO editor and whom he perceived to be making enormous profits from the success of Oliver. Nor was this the only difficulty with Bentley. He now expected Dickens to begin work on Barnaby Rudge so that its serialization could begin, as called for in the agreement of September 22, in the month following the one in which the last installment of Oliver should appear. This was expected to be March but in the event was April. Dickens did, in fact, start work on Barnaby on January 3, writing four slips that evening. The beginning is made, he told Forster the next day, and which is more. I can go on, so I hope the book is in training at last. He soon found, however, that he could not go on because of his distracting consciousness that his books were enriching everybody connected with them but myself, and that I, with such a popularity as I have acquired, am struggling in old toils, and wasting my energies in the very height and freshness of my fame, and the best part of my life, to fill the pockets of others. He demanded a respite of six months before working any more on Barnaby. Bentley agreed but in such a legalistic way that Dickens became infuriated and decided to withdraw from the editorship forthwith, rejecting Bentley's rather desperate offer of £40 a month just to keep his name on the masthead. The January 1839 miscellany was thus the last issue of the magazine to appear under his editorship. The last installments of Oliver being now relegated to the back pages, the miscellany's lead piece was the first installment of Ainsworth's Newgate tale Jack Shepherd, about the notorious young thief and escape artist, hanged at Tyburn in 1724. It was Ainsworth who, urged on by Dickens, successfully proposed himself to Bentley as Dickens's successor. To smooth the transition Dickens promised to write gratuitously a paper for the next number announcing, in the pleasantest manner in which he can possibly state it, the termination of his present connection with the magazine as well as two further papers to be supplied within the following six months, also gratuitously. These two papers were never forthcoming but the pleasant announcement duly appeared in Bentley's February number under the title Familiar Epistle from a Parent to a Child Aged Two Years and Two Months. Dickens presents himself as a concerned father handing over his infant journal to one of my most intimate and valued friends, Mr. Ainsworth and, pursuing the theme that it is a world of change, derives considerable comic mileage from something he had observed on the periodicals into novels. 1837-1839 Manchester London Train
This was the disconsolate demeanor of the post office guard when the train stopped to take in water and he dismounted slowly from the little box in which he sits in ghastly mockery of his old condition with pistol and blunderbuss beside him, ready to shoot the first highwayman, or railwayman, who shall attempt to stop the horses and looked mournfully about him as if in dismal recollection of the old roadside public house. Dickens must have spotted this melancholy official when returning from his December excursion, as far as we know, his first rail journey, or on the journey back from a second visit to Manchester, 12 to 17 January, when he, Ainsworth and Forster had attended a public dinner on the 14th in honour of himself and Ainsworth. Pleasant as was the familiar epistle Dickens wrote on his return to London, it had a sting in it nevertheless. Dickens says to his child, I reap no gain or profit by parting from you, nor will any conveyance of your property be required for, in this respect, you have always been literally Bentley's miscellany, and never mine. His long-standing exasperation with Bentley's continual interference with the conduct of the magazine is only just below the surface. 33 This exasperation may have been the determining factor in Dickens's demand for a six-month postponement of Barnaby and subsequent abrupt decision to withdraw from Bentley's. He probably also wished to create a kind of cordon sanitaire between Ainsworth's new Newgate serial and his own Barnaby Rudge a work that had for so long now carried such a weight of significance for him. Barnaby had first been envisaged as a novel appearing in all the dignity of three volumes and challenging comparison with Scott. More precisely, it would challenge comparison with The Heart of Midlothian in that the most dramatic scene of that novel is the storming of the Edinburgh tollbooth during the Porteous Riots of 1736 and, given Dickens's strong fascination with Newgate, it was more than likely that the most dramatic scene in his tale of the riots of 80 would be the burning down of the prison by the Gordon rioters. Since Dickens had already introduced a powerful Newgate scene into the end of Oliver he must have had mixed feelings about Jack Shepard's being the very next story to be serialized in Bentley's as it was bound to feature Newgate scenes also. Ainsworth's tale was on such a different, more straightforwardly sensationalist, level, However, compared with Oliver that only jolter-headed critics, as Dickens wrote in his 1841 preface to Oliver, could see his and Ainsworth's work as comparable. Nevertheless, the unfortunate juxtaposition of their two stories was there in the magazine though the last thing Dickens would have wanted was that his long-deferred debut as a novelist in the Scott tradition should first appear as what might simply seem from its context to be yet one more Newgate-related serial. When telling Talford on January 31 that he had broken with Bentley he said he was sure that Talford would be glad to hear that Barnaby Rudge will Charles Dickens be published next year as a novel and not in portions, adding that he had £2,000 certain, on the delivery of the manuscript, and £2,000 more conditional upon the sale. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.